uh, I'd like to talk to you today about some uh, interesting connections between the notions of game and puzzle and computation. This is basically my, uh, my thesis work from MIT. And this investigation started with this observation by Martin Gardner in a Scientific American column 50 years ago when he was writing about sliding block puzzles, the kind where you have a, some blocks and you want to slide them around and get one block to a particular place or something, a recreational mathematical thing that would be written about by Gardner. He wrote, these puzzles are very much in want of a theory. Shortest trial and error, no one knows how to determine if a given state is obtainable from another one. And uh, that remained true for uh, nearly 40 years. And now we know that there is a reason. Um, sliding block puzzles, like this one, for example, the goal is to get the red square from the top to the bottom. I think it really takes something like 57 moves. Sliding block puzzles, it turns out, are what's called P-space complete. Um, for those of you who know what uh, NP-complete is, you might have heard of hard NP-complete problems like the traveling salesman problem, Boolean satisfiability, and so forth. The P-space complete problems are thought to be even harder than that. So it's not surprising that no one has an effective theory of how to solve a sliding block puzzle, because there basically isn't one. Um, so we're going to be talking about uh, different complexity classes that apply to different games and puzzles. And this is sort of the landscape. We've got P, NP, P space, X time, and so forth. And um, I'll describe a little bit, uh, a little, just do a little bit of background to, to ground us in these complexity classes. These things are all defined relative to the notion of a Turing machine, which hopefully most of you are familiar with, a simple formal model of computation where you've got, this is an abstract computer. It's got a, typically a one-way infinite tape with some number of an alphabet, some symbols from an alphabet on it. Uh, it's got a scanning head that's scanning a particular cell. It's in a particular state. And as a function of the symbol scanned and the state that it's in, the machine may write a new symbol, move left to right, and transition to a new state. So this is a simple kind of model of computation. You can see this thing going wrong here. It turns out Turing machines are effectively equivalent to any computer that we have so far built, um, even though it looks very similar. So what will, what will eventually happen is perhaps the Turing machine will halt. And if it does, it might accept the computation, or it might reject the computation. Um, and it turns out that, uh, or what we say is that if a Turing machine always halts, then uh, it is deciding the language that it recognizes, and that the language or the problem that it's solving is decidable. So um, these complexity classes are, are defined in relation to Turing machines uh, of, with various characteristics. So the class P is the class of problems that are solvable in, by a Turing machine that runs for a polynomial amount of time in the size of its input. These are the things that correspond to real-world, efficiently solvable problems. The class NP is a class of problems that can be solved by what's called a non-deterministic Turing machine, which I don't have time to completely define, except to say that P versus NP is probably the most famous open problem in computer science, that the NP-complete problems are thought to be not efficiently solvable. So P is thought to not equal NP, but nobody can prove it. Beyond that, P space, the class of problems that can be solved by a Turing machine using an amount of space that's polynomial in the input rather than time, is probably a much larger <coughs> class. And then X time, the class of problems that can be solved uh, by a Turing machine that's allowed to run for a time exponential in its input length. So what we do is um, we pick some problem, like sliding block puzzles, that's a decision question. I give you a sliding block puzzle, tell you what the goal is. The question is, is it solvable or not? That question is p-space complete. Um, and we have now have a proof of that. And there's various, oh, looks like I am going to have an issue here. Hopefully, most of you can, hopefully there's nothing important down there that will get missed. Um, so there's various other games and puzzles that uh, the techniques I'm going to describe have been used uh, to show various, to show uh, hardness results for. And um, some of these, most of these are one-player games. Amazon's is a, or one-player puzzles. Amazon's is a two-player game. So what, what's the landscape of games and puzzles that I'm going to be talking about here? Um, you think of it along two dimensions. The first is the number of players. Um, of course, there's a familiar two-player game, chess, checkers, things like that. You can think of a puzzle, like a sliding block puzzle or a Sudoku game, as a, as a one-player game. There's still a game, there's a goal, and there's a player that makes moves. It's just there's only one instead of two. We can even talk about zero-player games, like uh, Conway's Game of Life, Cellular Automaton, would be 
an example where there's games where there's a, a tra deterministic transition of states with no players at all involved. And on the other end, we're going to talk about team games, and these team games are also going to have imperfect information, so the players are not aware of the entire state of the game. Along the other dimension, uh, we're talking about games that have a polynomially bounded length or not. So if you play Sudoku, for example, there's only a fixed number of squares in the grid. If a move is to write a number into a square, then there's only so many you can make, and it's over, you win or you lose. Whereas a sliding block puzzle, you can slide the blocks around forever. There's no a priori bound on how many moves it might take to solve the puzzle. So this is our landscape. Um, what I'm going to be doing is describing this general framework called constraint logic, which is a family of abstract games, all set with the same sort of background physics that can be naturally specialized each of these eight boxes. And what we can do is show that each of these types of constraint logic is NP-complete, P-space complete, etc., depending on the box. And the utility of this is then we can then take this particular kind of constraint logic, say this one right here is where most of the results are, the one player unbounded case, that's called non-deterministic constraint logic. We can use non-deterministic constraint logic to build uh, reductions showing hardness results for lots of games and puzzles, much more straightforwardly than we could uh, going directly from uh, something you would typically reduce from, like quantified Boolean formulas and directly from Turing machines or, or whatever. So here's a roadmap for the rest of the talk. I'm going to describe the uh, constraint logic framework in a little bit of, of detail. And then we'll look at the specific instances of 0, 1, 2, and player and team games. And I'll summarize where I've been and talk about what I think this all means. Well, there's, there's some interesting questions here about the relation between games and computation. So what is constraint logic? A constraint logic game is a game played on a graph. Um, constraint graph is going to be simply a graph that has edges that are colored red or blue. And a configuration of a constraint graph is simply an orientation of the edges uh, that satisfies the constraints. So what are the constraints? The constraints are that every vertex needs to have either two red edges directed inward or one blue edge directed inward. So you can see here the constraints are satisfied at all of the vertices. Um, now it turns out that uh, all we're really going to need to care about is two types of vertex that I call AND and OR. So um, a move, in general, in a constraint graph game is going to be the reversal of a single edge that uh, preserves the constraints. And so the general structure is you have a constraint graph, it's in some configuration, you have a goal which is say, I want to reverse this edge here, and the question is, after some sequence of legal moves preserving the constraints, can you do that? That's the general structure of a constraint logic game, and it's going to be specialized depending on how many players and whether it's bounded and, and so forth. So why do I call these AND and OR? Well, Suppose we want to take this blue edge and reverse it out. Uh, that would violate the constraints. But if we first reverse these red edges inward, now we're allowed to because we have two red directed in. That's a legal move. So that's sort of like an AND in digital logic. We have activated both inputs so we can activate the output. Likewise, a, a blue, blue, blue vertex uh, satisfies the constraints of an OR gate. If we activate either input, we can activate the output. So that's like an OR in digital logic. And I should say at this point, uh, this blue and red, some of you might have figured out, this is simply a shorthand for saying these edges have weight 1, these edges have weight 2, and the constraint is that the inflow, or the sum of the weights of the inward directed edges at every vertex is at least 2. So here it's at least 2 because there's two red edges, here it's 2 because there's one blue edge directed inward. So um, we sort of have this picture of these things this analogy between constraint graphs and digital logic circuits. And this is a, a useful analogy in some sense, but it only goes so far. Um, for example, in real digital logic, um, we have inverters. You can't build computers without inverters or NANDs or something like that. Um, do we have anything like this in constraint logic? Turns out that in the formalism of constraint logic, the idea doesn't even make any sense. You can't even express it in constraint logic. So we don't have inverters. But it turns out that's not going to stop us from building uh, computers or computational things out of these devices. And the reason is that this, the rules of constraint logic are not the same as the rules of digital logic. Um, another difference is that I talked about these input edges activating so we can activate this output edge. Uh, 
but the rules of constraint logic don't say anything about inputs and outputs. This is just a vertex with some constraints. We could just as easily say, oh, well, first I direct this blue edge, and that lets us direct these red edges out. So then we would say, oh, we've, this is a fan out. We've split this signal into two different directions. But it's the same, same device in either case. Um, now, suppose we would like to wire these things up, say, wire the output of an OR to the input of an AND. Well, we have a problem if we want to put that on a graph, because this is a blue edge and this is a red edge, and we can't identify them. Um, we can get around that, um, still, still using only ANDs and ORs. I'm going to use this shorthand in, in some of my slides. Suppose we have another vertex here that's only degree 2 instead of degree 2, and we're, I mean, instead of degree 3, and we're going to give this one an inflow constraint of 1 instead of 2. So what that means is that it's now satisfied by this single red edge. Um, if I wanted to reverse this red edge out, I'd have to reverse this blue edge in, and this will effectively propagate a signal from red to blue. Um, but we'd like to restrict ourselves to just these ands and ors. So um, here's how we do that. We can simulate two of these red-blue vertices with this collection of ands and ors where the constraints are all satisfied here. And this provides the extra inflow of one. So this thing behaves just like a, a red-blue connection. So we're going to use that. Um, one property that is interesting about uh, constraint logic that makes it very useful as a source of reductions is that all the, all the results that I'm going to describe apply even if the constraint graphs are planar. Um, so you can sort of generically cross signals over in constraint logic, regardless of the type of constraint logic. Um, so this graph here, we can direct A out only if, if, if and only if B is directed in and so forth. This is not an and or graph because these guys have degree 4. We can substitute these with this graph over here and connect up the reds and blues and so forth. Um, so that's a very useful feature. So what do we do with constraint logic? Um, what we do is this. We take a problem of known complexity, for example, the quantified Boolean formulas problem, which is you have a string of universal and existential quantifiers in front of a Boolean formula, uh, and you want to determine whether this expression is true or not. That problem is known to be p-space complete. It's kind of the canonical p-space complete problem. Um, what we do is build a reduction from quantified Boolean formulas to constraint logic. That, what that is is a, a rule for if you give me a quantified Boolean formula, I can construct an equivalent uh, constraint logic game. And by equivalent, what I mean is that uh, this constraint logic game is solvable. It's a, this is going to be a one-player game. In this case, it's going to be solvable if and only if the quantified Boolean formula is true. And since this is an efficient translation from quantified Boolean formulas to constraint logic, what that means is that constraint logic must, this constraint logic problem must be at least as hard as the quantified Boolean formulas problem, which means if this is p-space complete, this must be p-space hard. Um, so having done that once for each of those eight boxes, this, this is the, the one-player unbounded case here. This is part of the, part of the proof, one of the gadgets. Um, having done that, we then have this type of constraint logic, non-deterministic constraint logic in this case, that we can use as a source of reductions to show that sliding block puzzles are hard, plank puzzles are hard, and, and so forth. Um, and those reductions are generally much more straightforward than going directly from, for example, quantified Boolean formulas. So with that background, let's move into the specific categories of games. So I mentioned the game of life. This is a, uh, a kind of famous configuration in, in the game of life. The cellular automaton here, uh, Conway uh, lost a bet on this. He bet that there was no configuration that would grow indefinitely. Bill Gosper found this glider gun that shoots out gliders. There's all sorts of really amazing, cool gadgetry you can build out of the game of life. You can even explicitly build a Turing machine, as it turns out. And what this means is that if you run your game of life in a fixed, a grid of fixed size, then that means that some decision questions about life, such as will this cell ever turn on, are p-space complete. Um, so that's appropriate for this box here. The zero-player unbounded case has the game of life and other cellular automata. Maybe if you think of the universe, the laws of physics as being deterministic, which they're not really, uh, but effectively, then um, maybe this box sort of corresponds to what we can actually build. Um, so there is a type of constraint logic that is specialized for the zero-player unbounded case. And I can't really describe the rules in, in detail, except I will say that this, this particular type of constraint logic that is deterministic also has the interesting property that it is reversible. Um, reversible computers are an area of, of some interest. Um, 
A zero player bounded case is not really very interesting. That would be like count to 20. Um, but there is a well-defined type of constraint logic that lives in this box, and it is p-complete. Uh, most of our results uh, have come in these one-player games, uh, this box here. This is sort of the simplest type of constraint logic that lives in this box. The one-player unbounded case is you have a constraint graph, a configuration, you want to reverse an edge, and you get to make some sequence of moves. And you don't know anything else, that's, that's the rules. Um, so this, again, is a gadget from the proof. Um, so again, you just need these two types of vertex. And again, the general problem here is we're going to an instance of a, of a constraint logic problem is we're going to have some constraint logic graph like this and a goal, say we want to reverse that rightmost blue edge there. In this case, the way that you would do that is start by reversing this blue edge inward and then propagate the signal across. This is the fully expanded version of the crossover that I showed you earlier, built completely out of ANS and OR. So this lets you generically cross signals this way and this way, um, which as it turns out, existing complexity results for games and puzzles uh, they generally require building some sort of crossover gadget, and that's often one of the most complicated parts of the proof. <coughs> but because we've done that generically within the constraint logic framework, that's no longer necessary. If we want to reverse con or reduce constraint logic to some game or puzzle, uh, all we have to do is build an AND and an OR, and we don't care about crossovers. So I don't have time to uh, dive into detail of the details of any of these proofs as far as why that kind of constraint logic is piece based complete. But this is an outline of the construction. Um, you give me a quantified Boolean formula, and I translate that into an equivalent constraint graph that looks something like this. The Boolean formula part goes here. That's easy to make out of ands and ors. These things are gadgets that gadgetry built out of subgraphs that represent those quantifiers. And the game is to try to reverse this satisfied out edge. And this is constructed in such a way such that that's possible if and only if this formula is true. And as a result of all the details that go on here, that proves that this type of constraint logic is piece space complete. So let's look at a couple of applications of that. Um, I mentioned my starting point, sliding block puzzles. Um, so that problem that was open for 40 years, we lack a theory of sliding block puzzles. There's, there's the answer. There's the proof that there is none. This is the complete proof, essentially, that sliding block puzzles are piece space complete. What we have done is build a constraint logic and an or out of sliding block puzzles. And that's, that's the general pattern of a reduction. It's, it's a very fun type of thing. It's like playing with Legos or something. Any particular problem you want to address, say sliding block puzzles, well, the sliding block puzzles are your physics. And you're trying to build things out of this physics. You're trying to build these computational things. It turns out that all you have to build is this and and this or. And the constraint logic formalism takes care of the rest. It tells you that you can build these computational things out of these two gadgets. So how are these things like the constraint logic vertices? Well, if this is the corresponds to the blue edge and we want to reverse the blue edge out, that corresponds to sliding this block in. So if we want to slide this block in, we first slide that block out and that block out, then we can slide that block in. And this is fully reversible as well, just like an AND is the same as a fan out. Similarly for the OR, if we slide out either of the side blocks, then we can slide the top block in. And then we connect these things together in a grid like this. This is the full version of one of the gadgets in the reduction, a universal quantifier. Um, we can even strengthen this result. Here we have 1 by 2 and 1 by 3 blocks. Um, what if we only use 1 by 2 blocks? Um, that's also piece space complete. The gadgets are a little bit more complicated, but they, they satisfy the same constraints. So think about what this means. It means if I give you a box of dominoes, just a big pile of dominoes in a box, and say, can you move this domino by, by sliding some sequence of dominoes? Um, that box of dominoes is in some sense a computer. It's a non-deterministic computer. Um, and this is the proof. Uh, as another application, this is a puzzle I composed a few years ago in honor of Martin Gardner. You start with coins down here, so it says Martin. The goal is to slide them up here so that it says Gardner. Um, and that would be a trivial task, except for this one constraint. You're required to move the coins along the edges like that, but you're never allowed to have any two adjacent along an edge. So that's an illegal move. And it turns out this makes the problem quite challenging. This, this would be a legal move. So we can generalize this problem to say, I've got some graph and tokens on some vertices. The tokens are not allowed to be adjacent. Um, I'm allowed to slide a token from here to there. Can I move this given token? That's p-space complete. It's kind of a uh, dynamic version of the independent set problem, which is a known NP-complete problem. 
Um, and here's the proof that it's piece space complete. And you connect these things together like that. Again, you know, a one page proof, or less than a one page proof. Um, this is uh, a popular puzzle, was a popular puzzle a few years ago. Um, you try to get this guy across the swamp by walking on these planks, and he can pick up the planks and plop them in other places. I won't go into the rules, um, but this is piece space complete. There are the gadgets. Here's how you connect them. Um, rush hour is actually sort of where all of this work started. Um, Flake and Baum showed in 2002 that the game Rush Hour is piece space complete. Rush Hour is a, it's kind of a sliding block puzzle. You try to get this red car out of the grid here, but the cars and trucks can only move forwards and backwards lengthwise. They can't move sideways. So they showed that this is piece space complete. And their proof technique is actually what directly led to this whole notion of constraint logic. We took it and we stripped out um, one of their gadgets and simplified some of the others. Um, but essentially, everything, constraint logic owes its heritage completely to uh, this Rush Hour proof. We're able, using constraint logic, to simplify the proof that rush hour is p-space complete. And again, here are the gadgets. They're sort of like the sliding blocks gadgets, except these the blocks are not allowed to move sideways. Um, there's also a triangular grid version of rush hour. That's p-space complete. There are the gadgets. Um, Sokoban, uh, at least used to be, a popular computer game. Um, and that was shown p-space complete in 1998 by, as it turns out, a direct reduction from a polynomial space-bounded Turing machine. So Culberson showed how to build, literally, a Turing machine out of a Sokoban configuration. And as you might imagine, that's a rather elaborate construction. The crossover gadget itself filled a page and was very complicated. Um, this is what it takes to show that Sokoban is p-space complete using constraint logic. Um, so let's, um, let's move on to our next box now. What if we take one player bounded games like uh, Sudoku, for example? Um, there is going to be an appropriate type of constraint logic that lives in this box that is useful for reductions to those types of games. Um, everything in here, all these little subgraphs that shows up, these are just things that, that occur in the proof. For example, that this is NP complete, that this is P space complete, this is one of the gadgets, this is a, actually a, almost the entire reduction for, for this problem. Um, so, but now we have. Um, we need some special rules for constraint logic because we have a bounded game. We're only allowed to make a polynomial number of moves. So how do we come up with a bounded version of constraint logic? Well, it's very simple. We just say that every edge can only reverse at most once. Once you reverse an edge, it can't ever flip back the other way. And then obviously you're not going to have any more moves than you have edges in the graph. So that seems to be the most natural definition of a bounded form of this constraint logic framework. And uh, indeed, we can show that under those rules, the problem is NP-complete. Um, there is a slight complication. Um, I said all you need is ands and ors, but if you're going to fix the initial orientation of the edges, which you have to do in the bounded case, that sort of breaks the symmetry between, for example, and and fan out, I said, are the same. Now they're no longer the same, because you, you can't use these two gadgets identically. One only goes this way, and one only goes this way. And there's actually a third type as well, um, which is a little bit strange. Um, we can replace that with an equivalent <coughs> vertex, which is a red, red, red vertex. Again, we have the requirement that there's an inflow of at least two, so this is satisfied. I call this a choice because suppose you reverse this edge inward, then you can choose which of the other two edges to reverse outward, but then you can't do anything. When, once this one is reversed, this one has to stay directed in, so you get a choice. So these are the four gadgets that you want to use to um, show that a problem is NP complete. Um, as an example, here's this game tip over. Um, the rules here are you have this guy standing on these crates. He's trying to reach this crate. And what he can do is he can move from crate to adjacent crate, or he can tip a crate over so it'll lie flat in the grid. But once a crate is tipped over, it, it stays there. So again, it, there's a bounded number of moves because each crate can only tip over once. Um, and there's, this is a fun game if you get a chance to play it, very challenging. Um, here's the proof that tip over is piece space complete. This is looking down on the crate configurations. I believe these are all height two crates. So there's the four gadgets that we needed to build to show that tip over is NP complete. Um, moving on to two player games. Um, let's go look at the bounded case first because it's very similar to this case. So now we have we have the same sort of situation, but we have two players instead of one. Um, a two-player bounded game would be, for example, the game Hex, uh, which is played on a hexagonal grid. 
and the two players take turns uh, putting a token of their color in one of the hexagons, and once the grid is full, the game is over. So it's a bounded two-player game, uh, which has been, that was one, actually one of the first games shown to be piece based complete, um, even in the 70s. Um, so there is an appropriate version of constraint logic that lives here, and again, because it's a bounded game, uh, we have this broken symmetry in the and vertices. Um, now we also have to account for the fact that there's going to be two players in this type of game. So what we do is we say, well, some edges are controlled by white and some edges are controlled by black. And each player is going to have a target edge that he is trying to reverse. Um, and then the question is, if I give you a graph and say it's white's turn, can white win? That's the decision question that uh, we want to show is piece space complete. And by an appropriate reduction, I've, I've proved that. Um, now we also have to have some black edges here. This turns out this is a sufficient basis set of and and or vertices to build in order to prove a game piece space complete. And again, there's a slightly simpler one if we use a choice vertex here um, and this thing that I call a variable here. This is a, another um, degree two vertex that requires that either of these edges be directed in. So whoever gets to move first here, if black moves first, white can't reverse this edge and, and vice versa. These are the, the five gadgets that you have to be able to build out of a target game to show that it is piece space hard. Um, and one example I will give is a game called Amazons, which has received quite a lot of study in the um, combinatorial games literature. The rules for Amazons is you play it on a, on a uh, larger chess board. You have chess queens, and they move the way the chess queens do. However, after an Amazon moves, it then fires a flaming arrow, which moves from wherever the queen is, also like a chess queen, and, and lands on some square, and that square is burned off the board. Um, so since every move removes a square from the game, eventually you're not going to be able to move, and whoever can't move loses. So again, it's a bounded game because it's bounded by the number of squares on the board. Um, oddly enough, this game was shown piece space complete uh, by myself and two other groups almost simultaneously using three completely different proof techniques after it had been studied for quite a while. So that's a strange sort of occurrence. Um, here are some of the gadgets that you need to show that Amazon's is, is piece space complete. Uh, I don't really have time to describe them in detail, but as for example, um, if this is the variable, um, if black moves first, well, I don't have time to, I have some slides on that, but I'll, I'll skip that. Um, so that's most of the gadgets. We also need a fan out gadget that is actually quite complicated. That lets, so essentially what happens is if this queen moves here, that's going to enable these two queens to move, to move there. Um, so Amazon's is piece space complete. Another two-player game example, Konane, sort of the national game of Hawaii. It's been played there for hundreds of years. You can think of this like a, a two-player peg solitaire. So the white stones jump the black ones and remove them and, and vice versa. And again, whoever can't move loses. Um, another game that's been studied in the uh, combinatorial games literature for quite a while. Um, here is essentially the proof that um, Konane is piece space complete. It's very similar to the Amazon's proof. Um, so two-player unbounded games. Here we have things like chess, checkers, and go, where there's not some resource that's, that's used up on every move. Now you might think if you're a Go player, well wait a minute, when you play Go, every move you put a stone on the board, so don't you run out of space. Yeah, but there's also capturing in Go, so stones can be removed as well as added, and it turns out that these games can, like chess and checkers can actually go exponentially long. Um, so these are all uh, games there for which there are classic proofs in the complexity literature that they are X time complete, meaning that they provably require an exponential time uh, to solve. Um, and I should say here, and I probably should have said earlier, when I'm talking about the complexity of a game or a puzzle, um, it's only the generalized version of that game or puzzle that it makes sense. It doesn't make sense to say that an 8 by 8 game of chess played on an 8 by 8 board is X time complete, because the X time is exponential in something, and what the something is is the size of the board, the size of the input to the Turing machine. So um, it's generalized chess, generalized checkers, generalized Go played on an N by N board that are X time complete. And any algorithm that you come up with is going to require time exponential in the size, size of the board to determine the winner. That's, that's a proven fact. Um, so again, there is a type of constraint logic that lives there. That's part of the construction showing that it's X time complete. Um, and so how do we get uh, an unbounded two-player constraint logic? Well, um, 
we don't have to care about edge orientation, so we still want Ansonors. We don't have to care about edge orientation like we did in the bounded case. Um, we do need black and white edges like we did in the bounded two-player case, and it turns out this is a sufficient set of basis ands and ors, and there's, they vary by which colors which edges are. If you can build these five things out of a game, then you can show that the game is X time complete. Um, I do want to highlight the first game that was shown to be X time complete called Peak. Um, this is a game where you have a, a box with some horizontal plates that slide in and out, and there's holes drilled in the top of the box and the bottom of the box, and each plate has some holes drilled in it as well. Player one controls one set of plates, player two controls another. So on your turn, you take a plate and you either slide it in uh, or slide it out. And um, the goal is to reach a configuration where you open up a hole from the top all the way to the bottom so that you can peek through. First player to do that wins. And this, this was the first game that was shown to be X time complete. Really, it's this physical formulation is, is just a, an alternative way to state that this is a game played on Boolean formulas. You, you take a Boolean formula and you, you represent it by these things correspond to the variables and the holes correspond to the clauses and so forth. And if you play these sorts of games where I can switch a variable, you can switch a variable and back and forth, then um, you get this hardness <coughs> result. In fact, most of the source problems for reductions to constraint logic tend to be games played on some sort of formula. Quantified Boolean formulas can be viewed as a two-player game on a formula. Uh, Boolean satisfiability can be used as a one-player puzzle, find a variable assignment that satisfies this, this formula. But that tends to be the, the way that you start to show game and puzzle hardness. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, it's generally much simpler uh, to start with something like constraint logic to show hardness rather than going directly from a formula game. And the, the reasons are, are twofold. One is that you have a small number of gadgets, only two in the one-player unbounded case. Um, you have you, you, all the results hold for planar constraint graphs, so you have this, this already two-dimensional nature built into the problem you're reducing from, and there's locality. The, the constraints um, on this part of the board are very much related to the constraints on this part of the board because there's edges connected to them. So these are properties that apply to many um, two-dimensional you know, board games and puzzles, and they also apply to constraint logic, and so it's a much more familiar starting point than to start with something abstract like a Boolean formula to make a reduction. So that's, that's one of the main reasons that uh, these reductions are often straightforward. Um, so I wanted to talk about this peak game because there's a variation of this we're going to come up to next when I talk about team games. Um, so moving on to team games. We're now in the last column here. So why don't we just keep adding players? Uh, is that not interesting enough? Well, it turns out that um, if you just keep adding players beyond two, it doesn't really change anything because the standard decision question is, um, here is a board configuration, does player one have a forced win? Well, if that's the question, and there's three players, we might as well assume that players two and three team up to beat player one, and so that's really just a two-player game in disguise. Um, where it gets different is if you say that there's, there's two teams, but there's multiple players on a team, and we add this, this new feature, which is the players don't all see the entire state of the game board. Um, and in terms of constraint logic, what that means is that if I'm a player, um, I only see the state of some of the edges of the constraint graph. Some other player might see the state of some of the other edges of the constraint graph. But you always can see the state of enough edges to determine what the legal moves are for you. Um, there is, again, a canonical, uh, it turns out that the complexity of, of games of this type is non-deterministic exponential time complete, a rather unusual complexity class. There is a canonical um, formula game, uh, dependency quantified Boolean formulas. An example of a game in this box might be uh, a hand of bridge. So you've got, you've got two teams in bridge. Um, you've got a, a bounded length because a hand only lasts for 13 tricks. And you've got imperfect information because you don't know what's in everybody else's hand. So that's, that's the type of thing that this box is describing. Um, there is a natural version of constraint logic that we can construct to live here, and it's just like the two-player bounded case, except that we have more than one player on each side, so we might say this edge is controlled by these two players, this edge is controlled by these three players, and this player sees these edges, and this player sees these edges. So if we just define that naturally like that, then we can build a reduction from that DQBF problem and show that this type of constraint logic is in next time complete. Um, I want to move on to this box, because this is really sort of the most interesting one of all. Um, Team games where there is not a bound on the length of the game turn out to be undecidable. 
meaning um, that effectively, if you have a problem that's undecidable, it corresponds in computational power to what an unrestricted Turing machine can do, not bounded by any amounts of, of time or space. And in particular, it can use its entire um, arbitrary, an arbitrary amount of its infinitely long tape to perform the computation. Well, something doesn't really make sense here because all of these games that I've been describing, especially all of these games of constraint logic, uh, the way the game works is you have a fixed constraint graph in some configuration. Players compete to try to reach some other configuration, but the constraint graph doesn't grow or shrink. It's a fixed size. There's a finite number of edges and vertices. There's a finite number of configurations that the game can be in. But I claim that this unbounded team version of constraint logic is undecidable, which means that if you have perfect game players playing this game, they are performing arbitrary computation that can correspond to a Turing machine with an infinite tape. So how can that possibly be? And I will return to that question at the end of the talk. Um, there is actually a real world game that lives in this space. It's a, a blindfold team vari variation of Go, which I've actually played. It's a very strange game. And it's conceivable that game is actually undecidable, so that there's no algorithm, even in principle, that could determine the winner from a given configuration. That proof does not exist. Uh, it's very hard to, to build reductions in this space. Um, there is a variety of constraint logic that lives here. Um, some background, though. Uh, there's a paper in 79 describing this game Team Peak, a variation on Peak, that was uh, described as, this game was described as undecidable. And again, we have, um, it's, it's like peak, um, so we have these plates that slide in and out of boxes. Um, but we have teams, so this side might have two players, and we might have some barriers, so these players don't see the states of all of the other plates, whether they're in or out. And the claim was this is undecidable. Um, this is what I wanted to use as a source problem to show that this type of, the corresponding type of constraint logic is also undecidable, but I ran into um, some problems, and there's, there's a couple of technical issues with this proof, actually. Um, which I was able to fix and find a slightly different problem that actually is undecidable. Um, and that reduces to this particular complicated type of uh, formula game. In this particular type of formula game, I'm able to reverse to this uh, unbounded team constraint logic. This is most of the reduction showing that were various complicated formulas in there. Um, so this game is, is uh, actually undecidable. Um, so let's look back at where we have been. Um, what I've described is a simple uniform game framework called constraint logic. That is all, each of the different types of games and puzzles is founded on the common notion of a constraint graph with some common basic rules. Um, each one of those types has different levels of computational power appropriate to that type of game or puzzle. Each is as hard as any game in that box. Um, using constraint logic, it's, it's much easier than it has been in the past for some problems to show that they are hard by reducing from constraint logic. And finally, the undecidability result shows that there are very deep connections between the notion of game and the notion of computation. In fact, my, my thesis would be that you know, Turing machines are one model of computation. It's reasonable to view games as an alternative perspective on the nature of computation, where you vary the power of a Turing machine by varying the resources that it can use, time or space, you vary the power of a game computationally by changing the number of players and uh, whether it's bounded or unbounded length. Um, but the two are sort of fundamentally different in that uh, a game in our, in our conception is always played on a finite board with a finite amount of space. And so that, of course, does not apply to Turing machines. And so there is a fundamental difference there in the notion of game computation versus Turing machine computation. Um, so let's get back to this question of how can it possibly be the case that these games played on a finite board are undecidable. There's only a finite number of configurations. Um, as the game progresses, eventually the game is going to repeat, isn't it? So in what sense does it even make to say that there's going to be a long game that corresponds to a long Turing machine computation? Yes, the state of the game will repeat. Uh, but the key is that the players won't know when it is repeated because the players don't see the entire board. And in fact, it turns out that in order to play this game optimally, you have to remember the entire history of the game. So in effect, what we've done is taken this, this infinitely long Turing machine tape and shoved it into the player's heads. But there's a critical difference in that the tape is, a, is an actual part of the Turing machine. The tape, the, the infinite state, is not an actual part of the game. It's just 
what is required to play the game perfectly. Um, so if we lived in a world where we had perfect game players, where maybe we have some strange laws of physics we haven't discovered yet that will enable us to, to play games perfectly, um, we would be able to do arbitrary computations in a finite amount of space. Um, and I believe I will stop there and take questions. Yeah? I have two questions. Uh -huh. First one is, because you reduced the, the whole gadget production to something so finite and limited, is it now possible to write computer programs to generate these um, gadgets automatically? You know, the exhaustive research through some space, and then you will use some clever algorithms to prune, and then finally zoom in yeah. on the correct end and all. Yeah, day. and I, I use those techniques um, in some cases here, especially for the um, the question of sliding blocks when you're restricted to dominoes. Those gadgets were pretty large, and um, I didn't actually use the tools to explicitly search the space. I, I constructed <coughs> at least most, this was quite a while ago now, I constructed most of the configuration manually, but I did use tools to verify that none of the blocks um, could move in ways that I didn't want them to move. Um, in principle, yeah, in, in general, you, you could do that. You could, you could automatically search for these gadgets to satisfy requirements. In practice, um, the hard part is generally figuring out what the mapping, conceptual mapping should be from the game or puzzle to the constraint logic, you have to figure out what property of sliding block puzzles corresponds to reversing an edge. Um, and generally, in a lot of cases, once you can make that conceptual match and say, aha, to represent signals in an Amazon's game, the Amazon's going to have to move backward and delete a space here. This is how you have to figure out sort of the physics of your wires that connect the vertices together. Often, once you do that, it's straightforward to, to use that, that mapping to build the gadgets. But it's hard for me to imagine writing a program to search that kind of space without already having that conceptual mapping in place. Um, what was the second question? Second question is, I mean, there are a few dichotomy results. Mm -hmm. um, if they are those kinds of, um, you know, so given the rule, um, all puzzles in this framework either belong to P or, or NP computer, there's nothing in Can you show those kinds of results using the constraint logic framework? Uh, I have not done anything like that. That's an interesting question. We could I enjoy talking about it more later. Yeah? Have you ever done any work uh, with puzzles or games that involve um, random or semi-random uh, elements? I have not, and that is a sort of an obvious way to extend this framework. There has been a lot of work done on games with random elements, and there are appropriate types of complexity results. So there ought to be some sort of um, randomized version of constraint logic. Also, you can imagine a quantum version of constraint logic. Um, and I have not gone down those roads yet. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Taking them. Yes. Yeah. Do you feel like your research has made you better at chess? Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, I'm more of a Go player than a chess player. Oh, yeah. um, and I actually spent a long time. So I said there are classic complexity results here showing these games X time complete. You might notice I showed, I showed that there is an X time complete version of constraint logic here, but I didn't show any applications. And that's because once you get to this type of space, it's actually very, very difficult to build any sort of stable gadget using the physics of the games. The existing results for all of these are quite complicated. Um, I had hoped to be able to simplify them with constraint logic productions, but I, was, I wasn't able to do that. And um, no, I didn't. I spent more time working on Go than the others because there's actually, I, I wrote Japanese there, there's actually slightly different rule sets for Go and it turns out that the X time complexity for Go only applies under Japanese rules and if you use, for example, Chinese rules, both the X time, uh, both the upper bound and the lower bound break. It could be uh, as hard as X space or as easy as P space. So I spent some time working on that problem as well trying to build gadgets, and it's just too hard to build gadgets out of Go. How about uh, Othello or Reversi? Um, I believe that generalized Othello is P-space complete. Yeah, I have not looked to see if I could find a simpler reduction than the existing ones. I'm pretty sure that's that's a known result, yeah. How about N-dimensional tic-tac-toe? Um, 
n-dimensional tic-tac-toe, I think is easy, but um, I'm not positive. Maybe it's not. Yeah. I, I don't know about that. There's more work to be done. Yes, there's always more work to be done. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.